Revelation chapter 12. Cool chapter. There's a lot of cool chapters in Revelation. This one's kind of neat. Oh, look at that. It quotes the Didache. Then I was, ha, I just talked about that today. All right, chapter 12. A great portent appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. She was pregnant and crying out in birth pangs in the agony of giving birth. Then another portent appeared in heaven, a great red dragon, with seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Then the dragon stood before the woman who was about to bear a child, so that he might devour her child as soon as it was born. And she gave birth to a son, a male child, who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was snatched away and taken to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, so that there she can be nourished for 1,260 days. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but they were defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven proclaiming, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our comrades has been thrown down, who accuses them by day and night before our God. But they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they did not cling to life even in the face of death. Rejoice then, you heavens, and all who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you with great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. So when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of a great eagle, so that she could fly from the serpent into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time. Then from his mouth the serpent poured water like a river after the woman to sweep her away with the flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman and opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured forth from his mouth. Then the dragon was angry with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her children, those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. Then the dragon took his stand on the sand of the seashore. That'd make a great movie. Yeah, they made a lot of great movies about this. Yeah, the imagery is pretty hardcore. All right. What? I don't want to jump ahead, but yeah. is there a, a significance to the 1260 days? Of course there is. It's a revelation. Yeah. Everything's, everything's important. Are you going to tell us? Yeah. Okay. And in fact, we're going to talk about that. Let's talk about it first. I actually had it first in my notes anyway. So chapters 12 to 14 are what are called an interregnum. Uh, they just call it that. It's, a, it's, a, it's an interval or a pause. So you had the first, you had the second sevenfold vision, right? We had the trumpet angels. And now we have these interlude scenes. We have the two witnesses, the measuring of the temple. Now we have the woman and the dragon. Uh, and then we're going to have a couple more interlude chapters going on until the third sevenfold vision starts, and that is the incense angels. Uh, so we'll see those bowl angels, bowl angels. So we'll see them coming up. So an interregnum is a period between the kings, is the literal definition. Of it. Okay. So when you have a, uh, they also call it the period uh, between popes. Sometimes they'll call it an interregnum because he is technically the king of the papal states, when they were papal states. And he is the head of the government of Vatican City, which is an independent nation. Uh, so he is kind of a king. Uh, but the church calls it in Sede Vacante, the empty seat, because the throne of St. Peter is empty um, when a pope dies. But they also use it in a regular. So if the queen ever dies, that's what they'll call it until whichever one of her dingbat kids becomes... <laughs> King. Who's going to be King? Charles? No, it's going to be the kid, the oldest kid, the oldest boy. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Harry? No, he's yeah. the youngest. Oh, yeah. Well, William. Would be William. It's going to be William. Okay. I always thought it was going to be Charles. I don't think Charles is. Charles is the oldest. Oh, didn't Charles abdicate his ability to take the throne or something? I thought Harry did. Yeah, Harry did. He's the only Oh, one Harry's the like left the royal yeah. family. Yeah. yeah. Drama, drama, drama. drama. <laughs> And why Americans are so 
obsessed with the royal family. I am not. I take care of us. The last thing I watched was Princess Diana's funeral. Yeah. Because it was sad. That was so sad because she really she was, was a good person. Woman. Yeah. yeah. Other than that, I care less about right, the rest of them. Right. right. A bunch of snobby stuck up. Yeah. If their noses were any higher, they would drown when it rains. <laughs> I mean, I remember when I remember when Diana's wedding was on TV. Mm -hmm. and I remember watching it as a little kid. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Wow. There was nothing else on TV. Right. I think it was during right. the summer. I was home. I was a latchkey kid, so all I had were books, TV. Yeah. So that was on TV. So that's what I watched. I watched her funeral. Yeah, that bothered me. Yeah, that was how long ago has that been? That the, like her funeral. It's been more than twenty 2000 years. Two thousand and. Ish. Yeah, been right it's been right I know it yeah. feels like a long time. Yeah, I mean, it was the early 2000s at least. It was yeah. before 9 11. Oh, yeah. Is it? Way yeah. before. 1999. I want to say it was 1999. Okay, it's all right. I figured. Yeah. I remember where I was. I remember where I was working. So yeah, yeah, I remember long time like, first hearing what happened. It's oh. like, what happened? That's a dumb way to die. But anyway, yeah, so we have, we, we're obsessed with our loyalty. Okay, so we're going to see more of this in chapter 20, and we've had it alluded to a little bit already, but we're going to talk about the dragon's little season, because this chapter is about the dragon. 1997. 1997. Oh, okay. I was going to say, yeah, first 25 years. Go with your mm -hmm. Okay, so the little season of Satan, and he's going to call it a little season in chapter 20, verse 3. Uh, but it ties in specifically with this chapter and um, about this, this dragon and his obsession with this woman and the war with her child. Uh, the dragon did this for a time and times and half a time. We heard that phrase too. Uh, which is a short while because right now we're in this thousand years. Uh, figuratively. There's no real... There is not an actual thousand years where all of a sudden something's going to happen and there's going to be a thousand year reign of Christ on earth and then Satan's going to be set loose to wreak havoc and then Jesus is going to come again because that means Jesus came back twice. Mm -hmm. That's what our fellow right. American Christians all believe is going to happen, the millennialists. Uh, there were some early Lutherans in America who were millennialists also. In fact, one of the guys that helped found my seminary he was a millennialist uh, for a while. But so they millennialists believe that this thousand years is a literal one thousand years. It is a it's figurative, like ninety nine point nine percent of what's in Revelation. You know, again, we read our Bibles literally, but you read them literally based on what kind of literature it is. So if it's history, it's actual history. If it is apocalyptic, which means figurative language, you read it as figurative language. It's not, if you read all this stuff in Revelation like it's actually going to do that in the order it happens, you're going to go cuckoo bananas, first of all. And you're going to see, just like these people do, they see signs everywhere yeah. uh, instead of what's right in front of them. So this thousand years, the thousand years, or the great tribulation, they'll call it, right? Or it's called in Revelation. The tribulation began when Jesus ascended into heaven. And the tribulation will end when he comes back. That's when the great tribulation started. That's when it will end. That's when the thousand years started and when it will end. Uh, it's the whole time Jesus is gone till he comes back. That's what we're talking about. That's what this book's about. Okay, so this dragon causing havoc for time and times and half a time, which is neat poetic language. What does that actually mean? It means a, a little while. A little while. It's a lot less than a thousand years. So in this figure to thousand years, yeah, it's going to be really bad for a little while, a time and time and half a time. But how long is that? I don't know. A while. It's all, all we can say. But what it's supposed to remind us is, regardless of when that suffering is going to happen and how bad it's going to be and how long it's going to last, that is nothing in the face of eternity. So anything we face in this earth, it's nothing compared to eternal joy, right, in heaven, or the new heaven and the new earth, as we will see at the end of the book. Uh, heaven is not all there is. We're still going to be people. We're still going to have a planet. We're still going to do people stuff. We're just going to live forever like we're supposed to, uh, sinless, all that. So 
we'll save that for the end. But anything we suffer as Christians is nothing compared to eternity. Um, there are aspects in the life of every Christian which can be compared to this little season of Satan. The little season really gets started in later chapters when we see the beast come out of the abyss. That's going to be the great, okay, this is when Satan gets loosed, right? But we see that a little bit here with the dragon because the dragon's loose running around. So you see things repeat. Uh, Satan is going to stalk around like a roaring lion, try and find someone to devour. That's 1 Peter 5.8. Uh, and our other takeaway is, for times of trouble, is Christians are a threatened people. Uh, some of them are martyred for their faith. And it is through tribulation that we enter the kingdom of God. Like we talked about in the sermon this morning, like Jesus talked about through a lot of what he had to say was, you know, if you want to follow me, pick up your cross and follow me. But it's not going to be easy. It's going to be harder. If you think life's hard now, it's going to be even harder if you follow me. But if you want to follow me, this is what you got to do. So... Uh, Acts chapter 14, you know, says when they preached the gospel to that city uh, and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconum and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they believed. You know, so they're even commissioning new ministers going, hey, guys, I got a job for you to do. You're not going to like it and it's going to suck. <laughs> But come on, this is what we got to do. And that's what they did. Yes. We don't really do a really good job of recruiting pastors. Like, hey, guys. <laughs> it's a hard, scary job. Yeah. Like, and you're hey, held to a higher standard. Do you want to feel like you're a hypocrite every waking moment of every day? Be a pastor, sure. Okay. <laughs> okay, but in seasons of refreshing, which there are also seasons of refreshing, God is never going to let you be tested beyond the limits of your endurance. And you're going to say to yourself, oh, really? Hmm? I've been tested pretty hard before. So were you still here? Are you still breathing? <laughs> then it wasn't beyond your endurance. Okay? So there are, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says that. You won't be tested beyond your endurance. And that there are seasons of refreshing, the joy of which is like a thousand years when compared to our sorrow, which is like this little season, little season <laughs> Season of Refreshing. Uh, Acts 3.19, Revelation 20, 2 through 4. One of the messages about Satan in the book of Revelation, at first appearance, seems discouraging because it is another one of those woes. You know, woe to earth and sea, right? But when we really look at it, we realize we can take comfort from it. And we'll talk more about that. And the third thing we see in this little season is the dragon is really pissed off. He's furious, okay? Satan is foiled by time. Because, ah, here's the thing. God's outside of time and space. God created time and space. The angels are created beings. They are eternal. They live forever, right? As far as we know. We never actually been told that, but we assume they live forever. They're immortal beings. They're beings of spirit. But time affects them because they're part of the created universe. So, and we get that from Revelation, that you know the devil has come to you, but he's furious, but he knows that he has a short time. He doesn't have a, a long forever game. He is bound by time also. So Revelation 12, 12, you know, he has but a short time. He's angry because he knows he's been foiled by time. He's cast down from heaven to earth at a fixed point in time. Everything is working against him. His time is short. Time affects him. Uh, isn't that otherwise, now? he could just be infinitely patient. But isn't that now? Sure. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. So we can think, we can think of this as, in a way, the devil has been cast out of eternity into time and is entrapped by time as we are in our mortal selves. Uh, until such time as Jesus comes again or we die, and then we will give up being bound by time. We'll become eternal again. Uh, but does that mean the devil's going to die? No. It just means he's bound by the rules of time. 
I've never seen anyone else talk about this, so mm -hmm. I get that from Scripture. He's bound by time. Yeah. He was timeless. Then once he's kicked out of heaven, now he's bound by time. Doesn't mean he's going to die. It means he can't just play forever. You know, now things are going to happen in a, in a specific order. Uh, and Satan is furious because time frustrates him so much. Time is fleeting. Satan has his moments, and they're pretty bad compared to us, but they pass. He can't maintain them. You know, he can't keep the ship going. You know, the big hate ship, the big terror ship. He can't keep it going forever. It will have an end. Uh, and time is also going to come to an end. Because it is. It's going to end and it's going to start again. Uh, will we be bound by it? No, because we'll be immortal again. Uh, don't know what that's going to be like. There will be a new heavens and a new earth. So will there be stars for signs and seasons, just like in Genesis? Probably. Uh, but time as we know it will end. Satan knows this. He does not know how far off the end is. He doesn't know when that is either. Only the Father knows. It's God's one big deep secret. Right? Even Jesus on earth did not know when that's going to be. Now he's in heaven. Of course he knows. It's like Jesus doesn't know when the end is. It's not, as more, not, a, not, a, not on earth. Not in time. He was bound himself to time when he was here. Uh, so Matthew 24, 35 to 36 talks about that. Uh, that's God's one big secret. When is the end? Uh, because the end of time is also the end of Satan. That's Revelation 20. Verse 10, how do they say that exactly? Uh, and the devil is deceived them, was thrown down into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were, and they'll be tormented day and night for another. and ever. So it's not that the Satan is going to end, like he's not going to die, he's going to go to hell. Now we can talk about, is he in hell now? Yeah, we can talk about that as we go a little further. We don't actually, we actually have a lot of popular culture ideas of what, about heaven and hell. When we look at what was actually been revealed in Scripture, we don't know much, which is why we make a lot of stuff up or, or envision, imagine. Uh, but Satan knows all this. You know, he's not stupid. He's just evil. You know, he's smarter than we are. Uh, so he knows he has to use short-term strategies uh, against an eternal God. Well, how do you think that's going to work out? That's like beating your head against the door. But they work against us because, you know, we're temporal. He only uses one trick with us. Like, what do you want me to tell you? That's all I got to do. And you're going to fall for it because you're people. Right? Right. No. Maybe not. Yeah, but sometimes when you what you want to hear is what you don't want to hear, and he knows that too, but that's meta. Yeah. He's a good manipulator. He's a master manipulator. He knows how to tell you the things you need to hear for him to for you to go against your better nature, to go against your innate sense of right and wrong. He knows how to push your buttons. He knows how to push your buttons. Push your buttons. Okay. But he's so, not. He doesn't. But he doesn't know our thoughts, though, right? I don't know. Okay. I think maybe. Either that, or I always think he's like really. Like good at observing, you know, or listening to our prayers. Yeah, well, he is like, a he's like, a oh. master manipulator, mm -hmm. first of all, you know, and he's a liar. Mm -hmm. You know, everything he says is a lie, even when he's telling the truth. Uh, can he see in your heart? Can angels do that? Mm -hmm. eh? I don't know. Uh, scripture doesn't tell us what angels do and do know. Well, they actually they do know a lot of stuff. Well, we'd have to look at that. But as far as can Satan see into your heart, maybe. I don't know for sure. Has that been given to him to see? Is that given to angels to see? I don't know that. But angels do possess hidden knowledge. That is it's scriptural. So, uh, but you know, somehow, and that's pop culture too, is we've elevated Satan to this great cosmic battle between right and wrong. And then we pit God and the devil against each other like they're equals. They're not. Right. The, the Lucifer is a created being. 
He is an angel. He's a fallen angel, which makes him a demon. That's what a demon is. He's an angel. He's a little lower than God, as it's God created the angels. But he isn't God. Uh, and then, you know, as Scripture says, and then God created us, who he made a little lower than the angels. So the angels are above us in the created order. Uh, but they're different. They're spirit. We have a, a, you know, a living body and a soul, both. What's the difference between a spirit and a soul? I don't know. Nothing. Okay. You know, so well, so angels are beings of spirit. So when you die and we go to heaven, we are beings of spirit until we're reunited with our bodies on the last day. And then we will be beings of body and spirit. And then the animals are beings of body with okay, no soul. Right. right. Yeah. Children are invariably alarmed to hear that. I usually don't spring it out until confirmation. Mm -hmm. It's like, like, sorry, all dogs don't go to heaven. They want to believe they'll see their beloved pets again. Wait, reunited with our body. I don't want it back. Yeah, but it'd be perfect. And is it going to be like your 19-year-old body? I don't know. I think it'll be in our prime of our life because you're going to have it forever. So why wouldn't it be in perfect? It'll be in perfect working order. Be kind of neat. I'll take the 19-year-old body. That'll work. Yeah. That'll work. Okay, so... Did you dump tea? Yeah. Okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. Yeah, you got to take, take it out. Um, so it's no wonder that, you know, that Satan is enraged, right? And it's also no wonder that we can successfully resist him. Although it doesn't seem like that all the time. If you look at James uh, 4-7, which we're going to do the book of James yeah, after, we finish, after we finish Acts. I always lose James. Jesus' brother, right? Yep. Half brother. According to some. Yeah. I think it's the best theory when you read all the theories. Uh, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will free, flee from you. Yep. So, yeah, you can resist him. We just don't want him. Because the devil's way tends to be the more fun way. And sometimes the easier way. Yeah. You know. It's the easy path. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, and you know, how many times did Jesus preach about that? Strive to enter through the narrow door. You know, here's the yeah. wide door. Everybody can walk through that one. Right. You know, if you if you miss going through that door, I mean, are you like seriously alive? But the narrow door, it's a struggle. Uh, strive to enter through the narrow door. You know, take the hard path. Pick up your cross and follow me. Nothing in Jesus' preaching was, oh yeah, this sounds like fun. This is what I ought to do, right? No, thank you. I would love a warm-up. He's empty. Do you want sugar? Yeah, I'll grab one. I'm going back in there. Thank you very much. Oops. Perfect. You know, see, this one has a little more stringency to it. You want to warm it? Um, if you put your, sure. Could you put your cough drop in that hot tea? Probably. Yeah, yeah I was just thinking it would probably be good. Oh, no, we don't want that. And my tea would taste like cough drop. Which you like? I don't like them, but I don't like them that much. Mmm. That's like Dan and Kate gave me licorice flavored tea when I went to their house one time. Yeah. Oh. Is that was that was a little rough. Is there a paper towel or a napkin? Yeah. Got yeah, a little leak here. Okay, so again, chapters 12 to 14 are a pause between these two big sections of Revelation, which was chapter 8 through 11, and then chapters 15 and 16 will be the next uh, seven-fold edition. Thank you very much. Right, so during this pause, what we're going to be looking at is you see opposing forces, like we just had said, this great battle between good and evil, the opposing forces. Uh, but it's more than an interlude. Like we had that little interlude between the opening of the sixth and seventh seal. It's like, here's the sixth seal, where's the seventh seal? Oh, yeah, it's a couple chapters from now because we've got to do this little scene first. Um, it's more than that interlude. 
Uh, and it's going to be a bigger one even than the one we saw between the 6th and 7th trumpet angels, uh, which was like the two witnesses and all that. Because in this break between the 2nd and 3rd sevenfold visions, there's a lengthy pause, uh, or you could even say a cessation by which the normal flow of this visionary prophecy uh, concerning events on earth is interrupted. Because guess what? The portrayal of events on earth is suspended. Because now we're going to let John, God is letting John see a cosmic vision of events that overarch everything that's happening on earth. So now we're having, you know, just like the second, second fold vision was more of a heaven's eye perspective of the earth and what's going on. And the, the seven seals was like a first person view of what was going on on earth. So now we're going to have a God's eye view of what's happening in the universe, not just on earth. Um, and what John is going to see in these chapters 12 through 14 uh, is going to dominate and control the events that he sees taking place on earth moving forward. So these chapters visually explain to John and the things he saw before. So these chapters showing the cosmic picture is going to explain to John and then through him to us why this stuff is happening on earth. Okay, so then now we'll go into the text. So verses 1 to 2 uh, sounds like Isaiah language. Okay, so the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That's Isaiah 7, 4, 14. Uh, which it should because this is the story of Christ's life, birth, death, resurrection in one chapter. Actually, in like three verses, you get Jesus' entire life on earth because he's the child. Uh, the woman clothed with the son is Mary. It's also the church. So there's always two things going on in a lot of these visions. So we'll talk more about that. Okay, so the Old Testament background for the sun, moon, and 12 stars is the story of Joseph, who we heard about today. So Genesis chapter 37, when Joseph's dream, and he saw the 12 sheaves of wheat bowing, right? What was that? Look at that. Yeah. Genesis 37. The problem with those stories is they were familiar to us in Sunday school, but we don't read them that often. But like all of a sudden you read in Revelation, it's like, what is this? Like, oh yeah, you remember that story in Sunday school? Okay, so uh, Genesis 37, chapter 37, verse 5. Once Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said that I'm listening to this dream I dreamed. There, were, there we were, binding sheaves in the field. Suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright. Then your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us? They hated him even more because of his dreams and his words. We will see what will become of his dreams. And it goes on from there. Uh, and he has somewhere he had another dream. Where'd that one go? Chapter or verse nine, right? And he dreamed another dream, and told it to his brothers, and said, "Hold that dream another dream." The sun and the moon, which Jacob's. Uh, <laughs> oh, are you speaking to you? There it goes. I, I thought this whole. I thought this was all notes, and I kept mm -hmm. turning the page. <laughs> yeah. So we had another dream. I had the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. Mom and dad. Yeah. So I and your brothers have bowed down to the ground to you. Really? Huh. And guess what? That's exactly what happened, right? Yeah. Because we see the end result of that, these dreams fulfilled when Israel, you know, when Jacob went Egypt. to uh, Egypt and Joseph's the only reason they survived the famine. Uh, but that is where that imagery in Revelation is coming from. Okay, okay so the woman is faithful Israel. Yeah. Which, when we read, when we as Christians read the Old Testament and we read Israel, we mean the church with a capital C, the church invisible, the real church, not what we call the church. The people. So the actual people who are actually faithful to God, which no one can see that but God, which is why we call it the church invisible. Uh, the Old Testament in many places describes the relationship between God and Israel as marriage. Um, also in uh, the New Testament, 
or Christ talks about he's the bridegroom and the church is the bride, right? So there is no question that, and that's also what the book, the uh, Song of Solomon, so that's actually a, uh, a bunch of love poetry between uh, a, a dude, a king, and his wife, who and talks about her body and how beautiful she is and how they're looking to kind of get together. It's a little frisky for the Bible, but it's what it says. It's what it's about. But you can also read the same book. You read it, because I do this with premarital counseling. It's like, okay, I want you kids to go home. And it's like, you know, I kind of knock it off for a couple of weeks before the wedding, but read this book together. But then read it again. This time read it where it's Jesus in the church, because that's also how you can read it, uh, which you can do that with the whole Old Testament. So the woman clothed with the sun is the church. And then you can also narrow this analogy down to the woman is also the Virgin Mary, is the mother of our Lord. Because Mary herself symbolizes the Christian church. She's the mother of God. That is where God came to tabernacle. So God used to tabernacle in the tabernacle. Tabernacles of earth, that's where God dwells with man. He dwelled in the tents. Then he said, okay, I'm going to come into your flesh. So he dwelled in the womb of Mary. That's tabernacling. So she was the tabernacle. She was the church. Uh, so as much as we are Lutheran and we always kind of give Mary a hard time because it's not her fault that the Roman Catholic state too far praying to her and all that nonsense, uh, which got started really early. It turns out that was in the maybe the 700s, 600s even, they had started that whole Mary cult came up within the church. Uh, you still call her the mother of God. The Theokotos, as the Eastern Church calls her, she is the mother of God. She gave birth to God. That's the mother of God. Sorry. Some people are, like, uncomfortable with that. He refers to her as woman. Yeah. You know, like, you know instead of mom or, right. listen, woman, or I was like, wow. Okay. What does this have to do with me, woman? That's the way they talked. That's not actually, see, we read that with Western eyes go, ooh, that's harsh. It's like, no, yeah. it's just, that, no. But is she truly the mother, or is she just a vessel? Yes. If you think about it. That's yeah, she's, she's truly the mother. Hmm. She's not a surrogate. She's his mother. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so He's regardless so of what people want to say about Mary, she's still the mother of God. Mm -hmm. You can call her that. That's her title. She... Blessed are you among women, okay? And blessed be the fruit of thy womb. That doesn't mean okay. blessed be the seed that got planted in you by somebody else that you're right. going to give birth to. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb. That's her child. She's the mother. She's the mother of God. Doesn't mean you pray to her. <laughs> doesn't mean she can even hear you. But And the whole way that got started was, well, anything that you ask Mary, you, anything you ask Jesus for in Mary's name, Jesus can't deny because he can't deny his own mother. Really? <laughs> like, why? If it's against his will, he can tell her no. But, yeah, we're not, that's a whole different thing. So anyway, the woman clothed with the sun, that's Mary, all right? Because, and she does represent the Christian, Christian church. So just as Christ dwelt in the room, womb of his mother, he also dwells within the one Christian church. Okay, so just as Mary was full of grace, because the Lord is with you, as the angel told her, so also is the church full of grace, because the Lord is with her. So to interpret the woman here as Mary isn't out of the question, as long as you recognize that Mary symbolizes and represents the entire church also. Uh, so you can interpret the bride as both Mary and the church in parallel. And the fact that the woman was pregnant and crying out in the pains and agony of giving birth refers to the anxious waiting for the Messiah to come. So the whole church is crying out, when will Messiah come? Right? The faithful waited since the beginning for the Messiah to come. First promise, Genesis 3.15. That's how far back the promise goes. People have been waiting for it ever since. So the Israelites waited with great anticipation. Right? Then in verses 3 to 6, the great red dragon. Uh, 
the fact that he had seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven crowns, is important. Why? Do we remember what the lamb looked like? The lamb that was going to open the book of the seven seals. Remember what he looked like? A lamb? Yeah, he looked like a lamb. That He looked like a lamb that had been slain, yet he's still alive. <coughs> but he had... Seven horns and seven eyes. Okay. Right, so seven horns, seven being the number of perfection, the number of God, uh, the, the number of that which only God has done, can do, or will do. All right, so seven horns means all powerful, seven eyes means all seeing. Okay. And Satan's a mimic, right? So he has seven heads ah. and ten horns on his heads and seven crowns because look at me, I have seven heads. Yeah. I, have, I have seven crowns and I have. So three more horns than you. <laughs> Whatever. Because Satan is a great jealous imitator of God. He's described this way because he presents himself as God. He wants to be God. And it also indicates his power because he does have great power over the earth. Uh, it's been given to him. So it's this dragon that's contrasted with the lamb throughout the rest of the book. So you look at the this lamb that looks like it's on, it looks like it should be dead, but it's alive. Okay. We're going to contrast it with this beast, this dragon. And we're going to keep seeing that even though these beasts and these other beasts that are under the dragon's control are going to look like they're really powerful, but it's the slain lamb that has all the power. And Satan is going to continue to be shown as this great imitator as the vision continues by the way he tries to mimic the Trinity even. Okay, he sets up the anti-Trinity. You're going to see the dragon, beginning with the dragon. The dragon is a parody of the father. The first beast is going to be a parody of the son. And the next beast is going to be a parody of the Holy Spirit. So Satan knows the true nature of the triune God. Because he wants to be God, he's going to portray himself as triune in the same way. So the anti-trinity is going to be a depiction of Satan taking on uh, forms in his attempt to mimic the trinity. And we'll get more of that in chapter 13. Um, while we continue to identify, especially as Lutherans, that with the, identifying the papacy as the antichrist, uh, the office of the papacy is the Antichrist um, because it's in our confessions and I take vows to it and so the, pope is the, pope, the office of the Pope is the Antichrist because he is uh, but he's not the only Antichrist there's more than one there's not this and horror movies love this right like Damien and uh, the Omen the prophecy you know, they all talk about, you know, the Antichrist coming and you know that's the end times and all these evil things. This baby's born. He's got the mark of the devil. He's the Antichrist. Anything that's against Christ is Antichrist. That's what anti means. So if you want to put a capital A, the devil is the Antichrist. Simple. Uh, the papacy is the Antichrist because it continues to put the doctrines of man ahead of the word of God. Uh, and they have not repented from that yet. So we will consider the papacy to be the office, not the person, the office of the papacy to be Antichrist because they are. Uh, because they are. You need to do your part to get to heaven. It's not free. And until they uh, repent of that, uh, they're teaching against the Bible. And that's who? The pa pa Pope. Oh, Pope. Pope. Papacy. The, the, the office, office of the Pope. Yeah. He's called that. Okay. Yep, yep so... And I don't know why they picked Pope for a name, because uh, that just means father, El, El Papa. Uh, his official title is the Pontifex Maximus, which is a pagan title. The Pontifex Maximus was the head priest of the Roman religion, I guess you'd call it. I mean, it was really their religion, their pagan religion, and their polit their government was kind of intertwined because you had to like read the auspices in the heavens, uh, which you paid somebody to make sure you had birds fly the right way. And they'd go, oh yeah, the birds flew this way. It's a good day. You can do your thing. Uh, it, it was all corrupt. <laughs> and then the office of the Pontifex Maximus did a lot of that stuff. Uh, read the signs, pronounced 
things. They did ritual sacrifices and all this stuff. But it was all bound up in civic duty and the cursus honorum, that, that ladder they climbed to, uh, to go up in politics in the Roman Empire. It was all intertwined. So their pagan religions and all this stuff is all mixed up. And the title Pontifex Maximus has come down from the Roman Empire to the Pope. That's what his official title is, Pontifex Maximus. Uh, because it was when the church kind of took over uh, around Constantine and later uh, that the title just held. They started using the title Pope. So fun trivia fact. Do like Baptists and Methodists also feel that way about Pontifex? No, they, most of them are going to think like the people that you see on TV and on the internet who thinks the Antichrist is something that's going to happen okay. one of these days. Uh, right. But Luther is very, was very clear about it. Maybe went a little over the top with it, <laughs> but he wasn't wrong. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, he goes on his rants about the Pope quite a bit. Uh, often in the middle of sermons. But, but anything that's against what God has revealed in the Bible is, is Antichrist. It's against Christ. Uh, so we have to be vigilant in recognizing the manifestations of Antichrist in the world in every generation. I mean, are there been, have there been huge Antichrists before? Sure. Think about every like horrible person in history. You know, Pol Pot, Hitler, Hitler, Stalin. Okay, are those Antichrists? Sure. <laughs> of course they are. You know, that, do you think that somebody opposed to God? You know? uh, but it's not this boogeyman monster that's going to just show up one day and everybody's going to go, that's the Antichrist. Yeah. There's little Antichrists all around us. Yeah. Uh, but the Lutheran Church in its official position is going to call the office of the Pope Antichrist because we consider ourselves to be the true Catholics and we want the rest of the Church to repent and join us, which is never going to happen. Uh, but imagine but we believe, we, and because it's true, we are the true Catholics. We didn't break off. We broke off from them because they lost their way. But we are still exactly the way the early church was. And they went nuts. And then from us splintered off all these other Protestants, unfortunately. Uh, but that's the deal with Antichrist. Uh, and anything that's a false teacher, anything that's a false teacher is an Antichrist. <laughs> And false teachers abound. Always have. Always will. You can't swing a dead cat and not hit one in a bookstore or on the internet. I mean, 90% of what you see out there is terrible. Okay, his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and so forth. That is talking about the fall of Satan. All right? So that doesn't mean exactly a third of the angels defected along with Satan. Uh, but it tells us that number a third, just like all the numbers, a third just means some, but not all. Okay, and then the majority, two thirds, which means a lot, most of, but not all, stayed faithful. Uh, but it also tells us that the defection from heaven was significant. Okay? Uh, so the majority of angels saw the futility of what Satan wanted and continued to stay faithful, but Satan took a goodly number of the angels with him, which is myriads and myriads and ten thousands of ten thousands. There's a lot. Uh, how many angels are there? A lot. So how many demons are there? Uh, a lot. Uh, it probably would not be unreasonable to say there is one for every man, woman, and child on the planet, just like there's a guardian angel. I don't think that's overreaching. Uh, we don't know that. Uh, but that that's thats the fall from heaven. That's the fall you always hear about. Lucifer's fall. That's it right there. That's when it happened. Uh, there was a great war in heaven, which we'll talk about next. Um, good. That's just stupid, but it's always confused me with the fall, with, you know, the image, at least in my head, of, you know, his tail sweeping of the third, if they went willingly, or he took them with 
Oh, yeah, yeah. it's like, okay. Yeah, his willing. tail swept and he took him with him. Yeah, it's, if you read it literally. But his reality is, hey guys, I'm going to be like God because I don't want to be subservient to him anymore. Okay, let's, we're going with you. That's, so you don't think any of them were when forced? It, yeah. No, I don't think so. It, it was voluntary. Yeah, he did, did he did he trick them? Did they maybe not have should have listened to him? Very likely. I mean, come on, that's what he does, right? He's a manipulator. He's a liar. Uh, did some of them were they sorry for what they did? I don't know. We are, and that's not revealed to us. But you'd almost kind of have to think like, oh, of course, maybe, maybe we shouldn't have done this. Yeah, but what if they would they be allowed back? Like, could they repent and go back, or they, yep. they've chosen it's, their fate? It's not revealed to us. Yeah, yeah, it's I, not revealed to us. We need to know that. Yeah, it would be nice to know. And actually, in modern times, people have been thinking about this more, and that's why some of the fiction is getting more interesting. They're like, well, what about the angels who fell, but they were great? They fell. They're still demons, but they're still operating in the word, kind of trying to do the right thing. All right, so you have. You have demon angels, and then you have angel angels, and then you have this, this is fiction, of course. And then you have these, like, repentant angels uh, that know they can't go back, but they also know they need to do the right thing, so they are in the background helping people. I don't think that's totally far-fetched. I don't think it's that far-fetched. Like, that's actually pretty smart. Yeah. Uh, you know, again, that's complete fiction, but could that have happened? Maybe. I don't know. It's not revealed. None of that's revealed to us. Even in the... It gets confusing when you start reading the Jewish uh, pseudepiphraga, the, the Jewish texts that are not part of their scripture uh, that talks more about angels, a lot more about angels and demons, but it's not scripture, so read that on your own time. It's interesting, and it gets even more confusing. So, uh, But pe man has always tried to fill in the gaps of the story because it's an interesting story. Because we're not given a lot of information right. on angels because and Because you're not. Exactly. Which is why we speculate. And it's easy to speculate because whether you get it right or wrong doesn't really affect anything. So it's safe. You know, when you speculate on stuff that could have something to do with your eternal soul, you maybe don't want to play with that. So we don't. Uh, I mean, well, some do willy-nilly. but uh, Yeah. That we're always we're fascinated by that which is unseen. You know, that's why man has always been fascinated by the dark, by spirits, by ghosts, by whatever <laughs> they can't see. And we want to fill in the stories. I mean, look at the mythology. Look at the mythology and, and the tales every culture has had since the beginning that all deal with unseen spiritual beings. You know, not just angels, but you know, fairies. And sprites and norns and uh, and, and uh, all the things in Norse mythology, Asian mythology. There's a bunch of them. Uh, okay, so um, so the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, waiting to devour the child. And Satan knew the promise that God gave to humans in Genesis three fifteen. From that time on, waited so that he could destroy that promise upon his birth. In the meantime, he went about abusing God's people throughout history. Satan's attempt to devour the child at birth was futile. Christ was born, saved the world through his death and resurrection, and ascended to heaven to rule forever. All of that, which is boiled down into two verses in this chapter. Right? Uh, and she gave birth to a son, a male who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was snatched away and taken to God into his throne. That's the life Ministry, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. That's it. All of that. Uh, and so, but Satan tried to devour the child? Yeah, he did. Who do you think's behind Herod? Right, that's what I was Doing what he did. I mean, other than the fact that Herod was nuts. Like, Herod, Herod was sad. <laughs> that was a bad dude. But he wasn't born that way. No, no. Uh, but he was nuts. I mean, he makes, he makes like, emperors of Rome. He was right up there with some of those guys. I mean, he killed His whole everybody. Family, yeah. When he died, he had, I forgot how many people, slaughtered after he died. 
he had his people go out and kill a thousand, like hundred, hundreds of people, legend has it, that so that there would be mourning and gnashing of teeth in the land when he died because he knew nobody was going to cry for him. So he gave him something to cry about. How evil is this That's guy? Sick. How evil is this guy? Okay, but when it's just he's like killing all the kids, why didn't anybody try and kill him? Yeah. I would have tried to kill him. Protected. Yeah. Protected by rope. Oh. They didn't, they they didn't know it was Beth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Beth and her goons. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah. And then his son, the one son he didn't kill, apparently, was almost as bad as he was. So, yeah. So, yeah. And then Satan tried to tempt Jesus. It's like, if I can get him to sin, this is over. Game over. Right? So, hey. Not only that, the Holy Spirit like pushed him into the wilderness. Go do this. I got your back. And Jesus go out there and he tempts him after he starves for 40 days. It's not like, not like Jesus, not like the devil starts picking on him the minute he walks into the wilderness, right? It's like, well, let's, let's soften him up a bit. Well, you know, he's going to be near death after yeah. 40 days. Now I'm going to go, hey, he's going to want a you know, loaf of bread now, right? Yeah, so he tried and he failed because, you know, not God. All right, so Satan not being able to destroy the child instead focuses his attention on persecuting the woman, right? He focuses his attention on persecuting the church. So this 1,260 days refers to the little season where Satan will be permitted before the end to really go nuts and persecute. Where it's going to get, like I said, you know, it's all of this is the tribulation. But right before the end, it will get really bad. Is that now? Maybe. I don't think so. It's not really bad. It could be a whole lot worse. But before the end, there will be this little season that comes when it gets really bad. Uh, in the meanwhile, the woman is forced into the desert and she is protected by God. So then verses 7 to 12. So meanwhile, war in heaven. Michael throws Satan out of heaven at Christ's crucifixion. So when did when did the fallen angels fall? Don't know. Um, they fell probably before. I don't know. We're not actually told when Satan falls, but we have to separate two events that we do know. Satan fell, and he took a bunch of angels with him, and he was kicked out of heaven. Not the same time. Jesus or Satan fell, Satan's kicked out of heaven. Because Satan used to be able to stand in heaven. That's why he has the why he named Satan, which means accuser, as in a court of law, as in prosecutor. Go back and read Job. What happens at the beginning of Job? Satan stands before God in heaven and says, Your buddy Job, I bet I can make him curse your name. And Jesus and God says, no, you can't. He goes, I bet I can't. Like, okay, don't hurt him physically, but you can do anything you, you want. Okay, bye, I'll be back. He could stand right in heaven and do that. He's not thrown out of heaven yet. But now he's thrown out of heaven. So Michael kicks him out of heaven. When did that happen? Christ's crucifixion. Where's my backup for that? Uh, a lot of years of guys writing about this. But it makes sense. When is, when is Satan fully defeated? He's no longer allowed to stand and accuse God's children of sin. The crucifixion when the sins were paid for. So it makes sense. Uh, I don't think you're going to find any theologian in the last 400 years, it's going to disagree with me on that one. Uh, now, who is Michael? That's a subject of a lot of debate. Is Michael an archangel? Which, that word's never actually used anywhere. Uh, yes, yes, it's used words. Is Michael another name for Jesus? Maybe. Mm. Maybe the Mormons actually, is it the Mormons? No, maybe it's the Jehovah's Witnesses. Maybe the Jehovah's Witnesses actually got something right, uh, which would be that they think Michael is Jesus. And it's like, maybe. Uh, maybe. 
What do you got to back that up? A lot of debate for the last 2,000 years. I've heard it before, but I've never yeah. been convinced of it. Um, even among some Lutherans, uh, there is a tradition, there is a tradition that goes back about 500 years of that Michael is a figurative naming of Christ in Scripture. Uh, so Mike A.L. means who is like God. So maybe. Uh, if you read it that way, it doesn't teach you anything wrong or bad that is going to put your salvation in jeopardy. Uh, if you don't choose to read it that way, that doesn't change anything either. It doesn't change anything I'm going to teach you when I own it. I waffle. I, every time I teach Revelation, I start waffling. It's like, I think it's Jesus. I don't think it's Jesus. I don't know. I don't know. There's good arguments for both. I'm just throwing it out there in case you run across that. Uh, but he's the only other frequently named angel other than Gabriel, right? He's the warrior. Michael is the warrior. He's the protector angel. Um, the meaning and his angels just means Michael is the commander over the other angels. Sounds an awful lot like Jesus. Uh, it doesn't mean that Michael has full charge over the angels. He's under the command of Christ if he is not, in fact, Christ himself. Uh, but Michael has been appointed a as a leader over the angels. He is an archangel who commands the army under God's direction. And again, some Lutheran commentators do say that the name Michael is a figurative way of naming Christ. Um, and that goes back to the beginning of Lutheranism. Either way, it doesn't matter. Christ is the one in control. Either Christ commands Michael, who commands the angels, or Christ himself, in figurative language, is leading the charge. Fine. That doesn't change anything. Uh, but no longer can Satan stand before God in heaven as the accuser of mankind, like I said about the beginning of Job. The great dragon was thrown to the, down to the earth. Right Prior to this, Satan was permitted to come into the heavenly throne room to accuse people before God. Uh, Job chapters 1 and 2. But once Christ's sacrifice was accomplished, Satan is no longer permitted to come in. Uh, he can no longer accuse sinners before God. This is the binding of Satan that we will see mentioned in chapter 20. Uh, so again, a binding. You know, where Satan is bound. Uh, you will see Satan bound and thrown into the abyss. So his binding, a check put on his power, uh, that is what that is that we'll see in 20. So people want to make this, you know, this, well, this is when Jesus is going to take control of the devil and he's going to chain him up and he's going to throw him down. No, he's going to bind him. Satan no longer has any power over us. It's happened. It's accomplished. That's what this whole book is about. Yeah, there's some stuff that's going to happen at the end and there's some things that's going to happen right before the end. But the whole book is the story of your salvation. Remember that. So the binding of Satan means he can't accuse you anymore. It's happened. When that happened? The cross. Right? Mm -hmm. Then we're going to see about how death can no longer hold us. When that happened? Easter. Okay, so the universal atonement made it impossible for Satan to accuse anyone any longer. Does that mean all people are universally saved? No. It just means Satan can't accuse them. God will still judge. All right? So the voices in heaven, where do we get voices in heaven? I heard a loud voice in heaven proclaiming the first time. Okay, so the loud voice in heaven is the saints rejoicing at this event because the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. Right, so now you have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah for the accuser of our comrades has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. But they have been conquered. They have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of the testimony for they did not cling to life even in the face of death. Okay, so we know that's the martyrs we're talking about. Uh, and they're the ones singing those voices that were under the altar, remember, at the beginning? the voices that were coming on the altar and they gave him a white robe and said, wait a little while, it's not time yet. That's the voices of the saints. And I'm trying to see verse 12.
I was saying they actually use the word uh, Diabolos for accuser, but it doesn't. It actually just says accuser. Uh, where was I? Oh, right, so the loud voice of the saints in heaven rejoice because the accuser has been thrown down. It was Satan's activity day and night to accuse sinners before God, and that he is no longer permitted to do. Uh, the ancient serpent. So Revelation is the only place where the serpent of Gen Genesis 3 is explicitly identified with Satan, although it is made known throughout the Bible. But there's the only place where it explicitly says, you know, that ancient serpent, the devil, right? So what's a dragon? And again, I'm, I'm not adding to what Scripture says. I'm, I'm speculating. But like, what's a dragon? Because you don't see dragons anymore, do you? So before snake, when snakes had like legs and probably wings, they were dragons. And then on your belly you will crawl and eat dust of the earth. You will eat your food. That was, was his punishment for deceiving the woman. So now he didn't have legs no more. Or wings. So dragon no longer has wings. I think. I don't know. We don't know. But it may always made sense to me. It's like, okay, the dragon... What's a dragon? A dragon is a snake with like feet and wings. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in all ancient literature, when they talked about dragons, they talked about the worm because it's a long snake-like body with wings and legs and you know, fire. Okay, the authority of his Christ provides the reason why Michael and the angels can cast Satan out for it's the work accomplished by Christ that forever brought an end to the accusations of Satan. Christ has conquered Satan, and the saints have conquered Satan through Christ's blood and their faith by the word of their witness in his blood. Just as Michael and the angels were able to overcome Satan's power, so all the saints can now overcome his power through the blood of the Lamb. But then woe to the earth, uh, woe to the earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you with great wrath because he knows his time is short. Satan's very angry that he has been banned from the throne room and he will vent his anger on those inhabiting the earth. However, he is bound from deceiving the nations any longer. He can't stop the gospel. So when it says he cannot deceive the nations, that doesn't mean the devil can't do what the devil does. It just means he cannot stop the gospel. He, he doesn't have the power to do that. Uh, and he can't accuse anyone before God. So he can't prohibit the gospel from going out, and he can't stand in accusation. But he will have this short time before the end to go about deceiving the nations again. And we will see that when it we actually talk about the little season later, where he can actually impede the gospel. Uh, and he will be able to accuse sinners until that time uh, when he is unbound and released. But he can't do that right now. Right, so Satan's efforts are aimed at persecuting the church. But the woman's given wings to fly into the wilderness to be protected by God for a time and times and a half a time, which uh, also means three and a half years. If you want to put a number to it, a time is, is a year and a half. Year and a half? Year and a half. Time and times and a half a time. Yeah. Uh, it's the figurative time of escalated persecution of Satan's little season. Again, that's coming later. Uh, the dragon grew furious with the woman. His frustration is seen throughout this. He keeps getting angrier and angrier at his failure to put down the church. He keeps trying to do it, but the good news for believers is they are kept safe through faith in Christ, uh, those that keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Uh, does that mean if you don't keep the commandments, because there's that thing where we're doing something, does that mean if we don't keep the commandments, are we in trouble? Well, yeah, Jesus died for that, but... Uh, you have to ask yourself, if you're actively not keeping the commandments, do you have living faith? 
or are you just saying the words? Uh, so you can maybe examine your life, but if you can ask yourself a question, then you have to have a seed of active faith or you wouldn't care. So it's good to have that, like, am I, am I really living my life like I should? Am I? Well, that's what examining yourself is. So if you can ask the question, you're okay still, but it's good to do that once in a while because it's pretty easy to go down a pretty bad path and just realize, holy crap, if I died right now, I'd probably go to hell. And that happens to a lot of people. No, nobody likes to put their self, themselves in check. No. That's not fun. No. Uh, all right, so in the... And he stood on the sands of the sea. All right, so and he stood on the sand of the sea. It's really weird because... I like, let's see, what is he doing here? Yeah, I don't know. Do, do they have that as 13.1 in your Bibles? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because in the Greek, it is the last verse of the previous chapter. So mm -hmm. it is part of chapter 12. But actually, in my Bible here, oh, wait. it's in tw it's 12.18. It is. Is it 12? And he stood on the sand of the sea. Yeah, and then the and first verse, it, on the next one, is I saw a beast rising out of the sea. Yeah, which is which is neat because... It starts in mid sentence which John does that in the visions, and, and it's even in our Greek Testament, it's cleaned up. Mm -hmm. But in the manuscripts, it's just like, he stops in the middle of sentences and then just picks up again, almost mm -hmm. like someone was writing. Now, we don't have the autographs, the actual by his hand anymore, but you could just tell, like, he's writing like someone in a vision has got to write this down before he forgets what he saw, and he just stops in the middle of, what is going on? Mm -hmm. But yeah, verse uh, 18 is the end of the chapter, but it's actually also the beginning of the next sentence. Uh, I mean, now, I mean, there's a period. It, it just, it makes sense. The beast, then the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore and I saw a beast rising out of the sea. It makes sense grammatically. Uh, but that word chi, if you only learn one Greek word, learn the word chi because it's the most common word. It means and. And also then, and also, the, you remember a teacher told you not to start a sentence with and, the Greeks did it all the time. And it, it actually, you're almost not saying the word, it's just, hey, I'm a new thought, and. And then you got guys like Mark, Mark's gospel, and this, and that, and this, and that, and this, and that, because he's moving the action. And he's like in a big hurry to get Jesus to the cross. He's in a rush to tell the story, and that use of and keeps doing that the way he writes it. Uh, so John does that here. So it, it's like the perfect, in a, like in a TV show, this would be the fade to black. And it would fade in with that exact same line that they ended last week. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. Then the dragon took his stand on the sand of the seashore, fade to black. Then the next week, then the dragon took his sand on the, stand on the sand of the seashore and I saw a beast rising out of the sea. That's where we'll start next week. But it's like an in-between. Remember your chapter numbers and your verse numbers? We added those. Like the chapter numbers were around, I want to say somewhere in the 1300s, the chapters got added. And then somewhere in Luther's day, I don't know if it was before he died, but it was in that time frame, uh, right around near the end of Luther's life, verse numbers started coming in. Uh, and it took a while to get them standardized. But you'll see sometimes that Verse numbers almost make no sense whatsoever. They're like in the middle of a sentence. And other times it's like, why is that not two verses? Because mm, uh, they're arbitrary. They were, somebody thought, you know, if we do this, it'd be a whole lot easier to refer to stuff and know what they're talking about. Uh, so they eventually became standardized and there you go. Uh, so they added that stuff later. All right, so... But in the ESV, I think it's part of verse 17. Isn't it? What? 13, the last verse, the last verse of 12. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus, and he stood on the sand of the sea. Right. So that's verse 17, right? Isn't that what you just said? Yeah. Well, it's actually, it's verse 18 in the Greek. Oh. Okay. The way they number it. And then... It also fits perfectly. You can make it 13-1 because it flows.
Yeah, then the dragon took a stand on the sand with the seashore. Anyway, just fun grammar stuff. Okay, so uh, other ver other translations will put it as verse 1 of chapter 13. Uh, some scholars say that that is the best place to put it. Yeah, whatever. I only have an 18 in my yeah. from 17. Yes, yeah, so it goes to 17. Yeah, so the, the authorized version does verse 18, but that's what your Roman Catholics will read because it also has the Apocrypha then. Which is also based on the 1668, 1686, whatever, King James, the original King James. Uh, so anyway, the point is Satan, standing on the seashore, will bring forth a beast from the sea and the beast from the earth so there can be a happy beastly trinity. So that fun begins next week. <laughs> and now the story's getting good. Or bad. It's getting a little worse. I mean, if it's an action movie, you're, you're getting to the thick of the action now. It's like, oh, oh. it's like, okay, the, the, the evil genius has shown up, so the really bad stuff's going to happen. Was there ever a movie made that kind of follows this? Yeah, yeah, some of them are dreadful. Quite a few of them, I would think. Yeah, I mean, well, there's been a lot of fiction, like just movie movies oh, I know. Like using that, the imagery, right? but like an actual book of the Book of Revelation. Yes, actually, uh, Lewis Brighton, wrote the Concordia Commentary for Revelation. His son did an animated, like 3D animated version of the Book of Revelation, but the technology wasn't quite there, and it's like, but he does everything literal, so like what you're reading is what you see, and does it pretty well. Because uh, you can look at like the engravings from back in the day when people tried to illustrate this, and they're just like, well, they're doing it literally what it says, and it looks kind of funny to us. Uh, but he did it in all this like 3D computer graphics, and it's very dated already. You know, and this was just in the last 10 years or so. But then there is a book, and a uh, book. There's a movie, and they have it on Netflix. They used to have it on Netflix. They might still have it on Netflix. And it is called John? Or is it called Revelation? I don't know. I'll have to look it up. But there is. They did make a movie of John receiving the visions, and they would do the visions, mm -hmm. and he reads the whole book, but it's the story of John on Patmos. So you see him like hanging out on the beach on Sunday, and boom, he has mm -hmm. a vision, mm -hmm. and how they smuggled, because the whole point of writing this in code is because he's sending these, he's the bishop of the churches. So he's sending this out to the churches as their bishop. Here, this is what I'm receiving. Uh, so they show how they could have smuggled it out. You know, so there's a backstory behind it, which is plausible. Um, you, you'll think, like, if he's in prison, he's got it kind of cushy. Well, he's an old man. But uh, they kind of kind of showed how life in a penal colony might have been a little bit for a Roman penal colony at that time. So, yes, they did do sort of a movie of it. And it's not bad. And... No. no. Okay. I typed in John. I gave you John Wick. Good comic book. Got a little ridiculous in the third one, but it's kind of one. I heard nothing but bad things about the Matrix movie, by the way. I don't care. Well, I'm still going to see it. I'm going to watch it, too. There's going to be massive amounts of popcorn, and they're all going to be watched in the same day. Okay. Want another really dumb question? Sure. And I already know the answer. Okay. If God, the gifts and the powers that the angels have were given to them by God, why didn't he just take away the devil's power when he fell? Why doesn't he just kill you when you sin? Well, he could if he wanted to. Exactly. Once again, we're at, you know, it's a good question. He could have. Could have. But then we wouldn't go through all of all we But why do I have to go through it? That's not fair. That was that stuck with me hard because in your sermon today when you said Jesus' journey home wasn't easy, so why would ours be dude? Yeah. Dude. Is yeah. it called the Book of Revelation? Maybe. I wanna say it's got Sir um Dumbledore started oh, it. Uh, uh, oh man, 
He's uh, Richard Harris. So Richard Harris plays John. That's uh, the original Dumbledore. Because I don't acknowledge that other guy they got. But he died. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, the Book of Revelation. Yeah. yeah. Look for just look for Revelation, Richard Harris. Oh. Because he's starving. I forgot. So if you see Dumbledore, like, where's Dumbledore's hat? <laughs> and why is he on the beach? That's the Revelation movie. He was the best Dumbledore. That was a perfect pick. The only one that would have been better was Ian McKellen. He would have been an awesome Dumbledore. That would have made sense since Dumbledore's technically gay. Look at your list this week. It's growing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I saw part of it was about food. Oh, was it? It was. I, I saw pasta that. fajou. Oh, that was the soup. I already asked you that question. Okay. That's no longer on the list. If it is, it needs to be deleted. Yeah, so I didn't actually answer your question. You ever notice how good pastors are at that? Oh, you're you're a genius. Yeah, we, we take a class of that. It's like, here's how you answer your people's question without actually answering their question. And then they'll walk away like they just learned something. No, Until they we, realize, we, you didn't answer my question at all. No, some of us just smile and nod and rephrase it and ask you again next week. <laughs> yeah, that's the way to do it. It's I think it's called the apocalypse. That might be it. Is it Richard Harris? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. It's not bad. It's three hours long. Is it really? Mm, drama three hours. Mm -hmm. huh. Made in 2000. Yeah, yeah, it's not that old. Technically, it's not that old. Mm -hmm. But. See, but I listened to the link you shared of the best laid mm -hmm. plans. That was a good sermon. Huh. Not making that up. Okay. People are listening. Yeah, so to answer your question, so why didn't God take away the evil angel's powers? Mm hmm. Don't know. So our journey would not be easy. Not yeah. for us to know. Yeah, that, that's the answer. And so yeah. our journey would not be yeah. easy. We have to go through all this crap. Yeah, and do, so do angels, fallen angels have a journey? Don't know. Not for us to know. Only one person knows. Like we need another soap opera to follow? I don't care about their journey. That's their problem. They're fallen. They're, they're evil. They're demons. Bye. There's the door. <laughs>